Hello there, I'm Andrew Carter and welcome along to this Hilton audience with Martin Keimer video chat special. Uh, today we are joined, as you might guess, by Martin Keimer. If we weren't joined by Martin Keimer, we'd probably have called it something other than an audience with Martin Keimer. So uh, hello to the great Martin Keimer. And I say great because he is uh, twice a winner of a major. The man who stunk the winning putts at Medina in the Ryder Cup, former world number one winner of the Players' Championship. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a, a, a little round of applause there. Some of you will be silent, but a round of applause to Martin Keimer. Martin, how are you? Welcome. Thanks very much, Andrew. I'm doing good. How are you guys? Uh, fine, fine. Yes, plenty of guys here because it's not just Martin and me today, as you can see. There are 13 other uh, people here, 13 European Tour competition winners uh, spread across Europe, and they're all going to have the chance to ask Martin uh, their question today. Um, so it's a chance for me to ask some questions, but a chance for, for them to ask some questions as well. But anyway, how are things? I know uh, just before we get on to the competition winners' questions, I want to get into the very important stuff uh, and ask, have you just got a dog? Which is the most important thing for me. <laughs> yes, I did. You know, I um, obviously we all got stuck uh, at home for a few weeks, for a few months. And I always wanted to have a dog, but with our lifestyle, it was not really possible, you know, um, traveling around the world. And I needed to find a way to make one of my dreams come true. And I always wanted to get a German Shepherd. Um, so I talked to my dad about it. If he can, if he can help me out when the, when the golf, uh, golf season starts again, if he can help me out with, with looking after her. Um, and he said, yes, he would. He would love to. So fortunately, that worked out for me, and uh, yeah, I'm in love. What can I say? Oh, tremendous. I, I, I know her name, but I'm going to ask you to say her name. What's her name? Her name is Nelly, and Nelly is actually quite, it's quite a nice uh, story behind it, because when my mother, was, when she was pregnant with me, it was supposed to be a girl, so my parents thought, okay, maybe, we're gonna sh maybe we should call her Nelly. And then, um, obviously, I came out. I'm not a Nelly. And then... Uh, then uh, I said to my dad, would you mind if I call my, my dog Nelly? And he paused for a few seconds and he thought, now my daughter will become a dog. I said, well, that's the closest you can get to that name. You know, that's, only, I, that's the only thing I can give you, a dog. Perfect. So this is, this is the insight you can only get on Hilton's and audience with Martin Keimer. So you're very, very lucky, all of you. Right. Anyway, just uh, again, a couple of questions from me. So how are things going at the moment? Because you had a couple of good finishes recently, um, not in, in Scotland last week, just narrowly missed the cup, but the form seems to be almost there for you at the moment. Yeah, it's a bit up and down right now. And, uh, you know, I, I missed the, cup, uh, the, the cut in, uh, in America um, at the PGA Championship and at the US Open, but then had a top two, top three finish um, here in Europe. Um, you know, last week in Scotland, it was very unfortunate. Um, so the last few events, there was always one shot. You know, I, I missed the shot. Uh, I missed the cut by one shot at the PGA Championship. Then that came short, one shot at the Belfry, at Valderrama. Missed the cut by one shot at the US Open and last week. So that one shot, that really hunts me down. But I mean, I mean I'm feeling good. You know, my game feels fairly solid. I've been working quite hard over the last few weeks to get more consistency into my game. Uh, I worked a lot on the putting and uh, there was always a bit of my weaknesses. Um, so that worked out well. And this week we play here in, in Wentworth, which is always a huge event for us, flagship event, Rolex series event. Um, and it's very, very important, you know, but by the end of the year to, to gain a few more points um, talking about next seasons, getting ready for World Cup champion events. If you finish in the top 10 or even maybe even the top 20 at the, um, by the end of the year with the, in the race to Dubai. So it's a big week here for us. Mm. And just in general, how are you finding the, the, the whole situation this year? How have you been coping with it? Gol golf apart, how, how is, is life for you in 2020? Andrew, it has been fantastic. You know, in what um, professional... Career, you know, if, if you're an athlete and an active professional career, do you have that much time off? You know, it's very rare. So I really enjoyed being home for, uh, being home for four months, doing completely different stuff, um, hanging out with my dad. Um, he showed me a lot how to build certain things in the house. We built a little terrace out of concrete. You know, we put wood on top and he knows all those stuff. So he taught me. And it was really, really nice and interesting. I really enjoyed that living a normal lifestyle because the lifestyle that we live 
you know, 35, 40 weeks in hotel rooms is not normal. Just sleeping in your own bed for two, three months straight has been has been amazing. And um, I can see that this lifestyle is nothing for me. That was also important. You know, I enjoy that lifestyle, traveling, traveling around the world, meeting different cultures. So it showed me a lot also what um, yeah, option alternative I would have if I wouldn't play golf. And for now, you know, without having children, without having a wife, then I think that would be really nice to continue as long as possible until the family comes into its play. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. Another look at uh, sort of at the other side of 2020 because it's been difficult for so many people, but also there are positives that you can take from it. So anyway, listen, we've got, as I said, 13 competition winners from five different countries. So just by name, I'm going to try and guess where they're from. But first of all, our first question is going to be from Stefan Bunemann. Now, um, we have Stefan we have uh, winners from Germany. So is Stefan from Germany? I hope we have Stefan Bunemann there. Hello, Stefan. Hello, hi, Martin. Hello there. Hi. So I'm actually from Martin's hometown, Düsseldorf. So um, very nice. So um, my question would be going towards um, the Ryder Cup next year. So how do you see the chances making the, the European team again for the Ryder Cup next year? And a little bit related, um, do you think that you won a major already on that course where the Ryder Cup is played is probably increasing your chances also making a wild card if necessary? Well, obviously, the Ryder Cup has been has been always on my radar since I since I played it. Um, before I played in 2010, 2008, I was invited by Nick Faldo to come and, and join the team and get a little sniff of how it feels to play the Ryder Cup, be part of it. So, and since then, it has been always one of my goals. So, of course, um, I will do everything I can to be part of that team, and of course, I will have a chance to make the team. Um, if I play my game and if I, if I play solid the way I can play golf, um, I think there should be a possibility to make the team. Um, I don't know if it, if it could help me that I won the PGA Championship in Rissing Straits in 2010 in terms of uh, wild cards. Um, I wouldn't think about it that way. You know, Maybe it could help me out in the end if it's between me and somebody else. But this is not really interesting. You know, for me, it's interesting to make the team because if you don't really make the team, if you get a wild card, at least that's the way I fell in 2016, you never really feel like you deserve to be there. You know, of course, um, it's nice to be there and, and do something for the Ryder Cup team, but you want to make it on your own. Um, so if you get the wild card, it's always great. What a what a great pleasure and honor to to believe to get that trust from the captain. But in an ideal world, I would like to make it myself. Thank you very much indeed, okay. Stefan. That's a, a um, great question, great answer. And to hear two German people talking so fluently in English puts us all to shame in the UK. If we had two <laughs> British people trying to ask and answer questions in German, we would not get very far. So um, your German is good enough, Andrew. My you German is uh, yeah, ich spreche ein bisschen. It's wonderful. I'm good. Yes, exactly. My Großvater war Deutsch. Uh, right. Okay. Moving on to more <laughs> important matters. Um, uh, next question from uh, from Stephanie. Stephanie de de Muth. And uh, my pronunciation, Stephanie, is very poor. But hello, Stephanie, and your question to Martin is? Um, first of all, I have to say so I uh, exactly now have to look after my one year and a half son, <laughs> which is playing at the toilet. Um, this so she ran earlier. <laughs> I'm just uh, asking my question and hope he will uh, do nothing improper. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, but I didn't want to miss that chance, Martin. So uh, okay. I do it. Um, Martin, um, how do you prepare yourself um, for a tournament or, or better you and Craig? How much time does it cost for you to prepare um, for a tournament regarding um, playing testing rounds or um, preparing the birdie book, uh, looking at uh, the 18 holes or whatever. How much time does it take for you? Well, it really depends on the golf course, you know, if we have been there before or not. Um, for example, a week like this here in Wentworth, I've been here many times before. Since I turned pro, I've I've played that golf that golf tournament. So I mean, for example, a day like this, you know, I woke up at 6:30. Um, I did some stretching in the morning. I went for went for breakfast. Um, went to the driving range. We hit some balls. Um, played nine holes. Had some lunch. Practiced more. A bit of putting. A bit of chipping. 
Um, then I did some media earlier today already by four o'clock. Now is uh, is five thirty here, so it's like a twelve thirteen hour day, um, and that's and that's the day before the tournament. It's not ideal, but um, I really want to spend more time on the golf course. I want to get a, a little bit of a of a feel for the for the golf course. Got a place very different this year than the previous years that we have been here. It's a different time of the year. Golf course plays longer, a lot wetter. Or oh, I think your son is calling. Um, so, so it really depends on, you can bring her up. Let's yeah, see. here it is. Hello. Say What's hi. Your name? Wie uh, heißt hallo. Du? hallo. Ich heiße Maxi. Yeah. Yeah. Hallo Maxi. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's basically what, that's basically what we're doing. You know, we're just trying to see how, how well we know the golf course. Um, but it depends so much. Um, practice rounds, I would say I play 27 holes usually before the actual tournament. That's a great question. Well done, Maxi, as well, with the very important work that you're doing at the moment, um, because this is a, clearly a big stage in your progression. And uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Feeling good with that. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Stephanie, as well. Right, I've got to rattle along because, as Martin said, you know, he's very busy and a long day the day before a tournament. So, Davy Martin, where is Davy Martin? Davy, your question for Martin is Hi, guys. Uh, first of all, good luck, Martin, for this week because I think the course suits you. Thank you. Um, uh, I know that you just mentioned there you know, when you were chatting to us that your dad was a big influence in everything you're doing, even in the DIY. And I know your brother's a keen golfer, but he's been a big influence for you for your progression today, today, to now. Um, who in the, the golfing world has been an influence to you? Well, I would say maybe he doesn't even know about it, um, but Thomas Bjorn, he helped me out quite a lot. You know, just. Um, I played with him a few practice rounds in the past. We had some very interesting and good chats over the last few years. Um, I would have loved to make his Ryder Cup team. Unfortunately, it uh, didn't quite happen. But uh, Thomas, he has been a good help once I got on tour. Um, before that, it, it was definitely Bernard Langer and, and Ernie Els. You know, those two guys I really look up to, obviously, for different reasons. Um, Bernard, you know, is, is, is coming from Germany, having amazing success in America at, at a time where golf was not really big in Germany. Um, and Ernie was just one of those guys. Uh, I just loved playing with him. I loved watching him and I was very privileged last year to play the US Open in Pebble Beach with him the first two rounds. I think that was his last US Open that, that he played. So it was quite nice to, yeah, to have that opportunity to play with him the last time that he plays the US Open. Good luck. Thanks very much, David. Steve Lester. Steve, you have your question. Hopefully, you're unmuted and ready to go. Yes. Uh, hi, Martin. Hi, uh, we all love you. You're a great guy and obviously a brilliant golfer. But I was wondering, who are your close friends on the European Tour and the players you most like to be drawn with and why? Steve, are you, are you asking there, can I translate that as saying, are you asking who he doesn't like as well, basically, by, by, by well, process of I, yes, elimination? That is true, but I, if we get an answer, that'd be good, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if we, um, you know, to be really close with, with people, I don't know, you know, we all have jobs um, in an ideal world, and they, they are guys that, that you get along with better, and, and some guys you don't really mind if they disappear the next day, if they never show up at work again. We also have that here in our golfing world. That is very normal, I believe. Um, but I really, really enjoy playing with Phil Mickelson. When I'm paired with Phil, I, you know, I feel like I will play one or two shots better. Just because of his attitude, the way he plays golf. Um, and obviously he takes a lot of risks, but is it really a risk if you believe you can do it, you know, that attitude that he has in every single shot, even if he hits a bad shot, he is almost, you can almost see it, that he for, forget about that shot and continues his game. And it's very inspiring that having that attitude, it's very difficult to have that attitude, but when I'm paired with him, I really enjoy it. Another one is Patrick Harrington. He's very positive. You can, at the beginning I thought, you know, that can't be real what he's doing. When I watch him on TV, if he makes a bogey or double bogey putt, people were clapping and he was saying, thanks very much. You're mad, you're steaming inside, but he still has that positivity about him. And that is what I, what I really enjoy because I know it's, it's authentic, it's true, after, after getting to know him after a few years. So, so those two guys um, I, I really enjoy playing with. 
Thank you very much indeed for that. Yes, keep Thank it you. positive. Who we like. Thanks for that question, Steve, as well. Right, Jason Davis. Jason Davis. Where is Jason? And Jason, hey, what is your question? Yeah, thanks for hosting this. Very enjoying it a lot. Um, I've got two small children, eight-year-old Cameron, 10-year-old Jasmine. They gave me these two questions quickly. What's your favorite golf course and why? And my daughter's 10 and loves golf. If you could give advice to your 10-year-old self, what would you tell him? So favorite golf course, uh, I had a question last week at the Scottish Open. Um, we had to name our top five. Um, I, had all, I had them all for different reasons. Um, but if I would have to pick one golf course that, that I play for the rest of my life, I would be between Pebble Beach and Valderrama. Um, those two golf courses, they have a charm. You know, when you walk, when you walk the holes, there's something with it. You know, it's, it's very difficult to put into words. It's a very, very special, unique place where you can feel um, the history and the love and the passion for the for the game. So those two, that would be my my courses that I would love to play. To for your daughter, I know, ten years old. What kind of tips should you give a ten year old girl? Just enjoy the game. You know, there's nothing about technique. Nothing about you need to um, reach a certain handicap when, when you're 12, when you're 15. It's about, about the enjoyment, and that is what also we miss sometimes, you know, playing golf every week, playing for prize money, world ranking points. Sometimes you forget why you started the game. So I think you should always make sure that your kids enjoy the game, because if they don't enjoy it, they're never going to be good at it. You need to keep the fun, and, um, and that is fortunately what my, what my parents did very, very well with my brother and me. And that, was, that would be my advice to, um, to you guys and for your daughter. Have fun with the other girls, play rounds with them and do some crazy chipping competitions when, it, when it's getting dark. Enjoy the sport. Thanks, uh, Martin. Thanks, Jason. Is that your daughter in the background there? Jason? It is, yes. She's... Hello. Can she hear? Hello. What's her name? Did you listen? Did Jasmine. You listen? Jasmine. Jasmine, come over here. Jasmine, come over here. Jasmine. Jasmine, Jasmine did you listen? Here. She was listening. Were you listening? There you listening? go. There we go. That's uh, that's a new fair uh, completed a very important job of a father there, Jason, in embarrassing your children as well. So <laughs> that's what we've got to do. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jasmine Cameron and Jason. Right, um, Sean Johnson. Sean is the has got the next question for us. Sean, are you there? I am. Thank you, Andrew, and greetings, Martin. My question is as follows: In light of the challenges that current global pandemic has thrown us with coronavirus um, and the world of professional golf such as obviously playing in tournaments without uh, spectators and social distancing distancing what are the key elements in your mental and psychological preparation that you and your team have had to work on in order to maintain that competitive edge and will those be carried um, forward into this week's tournaments or are you going to be having a slightly different tactic in that approach well, the, the, the biggest difference that I noticed that I didn't know before, you know, I thought at the beginning, you know, the, the atmosphere that will be missing, um, the clapping and, you know, just the interaction with the fans. Um, but what was really missing, what I noticed a lot when I played at the Belfry, when I played in Valderrama, when it was about trying to win a golf tournament, there's that intensity between the fans and the players. The, the fans, they feel what what we almost feel you know they know okay he's one shot behind he has done this and that in the past he has done or he, he made some great shots coming down the stretch in the past he made some big putts this guy we don't really know about so you know you can feel that intensity that that atmosphere is different while i was playing those two tournaments there was zero zero of that it was just between your caddy um yourself and obviously the opponent that you that you had to beat so that was the biggest surprise for me that I missed, I missed that intensity and that um, feeling between the fans, the spectators and, and the player. Um, sorry, the second part of the question was? So, uh, so yeah, so with the mental and obviously psychological aspects to your game, taking it forward, will we see that carry through to this week's tournament or will you be approaching it from your mental preparation for Wentworth a little bit differently with the current situation or will it just be a carbon copy paste of what you've been doing? No, I think um, I will. I will continue having that attitude. You know that you need to you need to p pick up yourself a little bit at certain times. That there's not much, um, yeah, not much positivity w w when you hit good shots because you 
almost sometimes, or I had it last week also in Scotland, you know, I had an amazing shot exactly the way I wanted it. And there was no one clapping. There was nothing. It was an amazing golf shot. And I said to Craig, geez, I mean, how good was that shot? So I, you need to pick up yourself. You know, you feel like a fool sometimes, but that's what, what you're going to do. And that is, I guess, what you should do anyways. But sometimes it's more subconscious. And because the fans, they obviously know, especially when you play in the UK, you know how good certain shots are. So you need to um, have that mentality yourself. And I think that is something very good that you learn from, from that time that we are playing golf in right now. Oh, brilliant. Amazing. Yeah. And all That's the best. Amazing. Really hope you bounce you for this weekend. Thanks, Sean. Cheers. Thank you, Sean, for the question. It is fascinating without fans. Um, right, uh, William Egberg. Uh, I can see you there, William. Um, I'm guessing from Sweden, but again, that's just a wild guess. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so sorry, what's your question? Yeah, that's correct. I'm from Sweden. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah my question is why um, you always seem uh, very calm and composed on the course. So how do you handle nervous situations or shots that may affect or annoy you? To you make sure that you stay calm and uh, the next shot is not affected. You should see me playing FIFA against my brother. We already had a few controllers throwing, uh, flying through the room. Um, but on the golf course, um, you know, when you're an amateur, you, you learn it or you get taught by your coaches, you know, don't get affected too much by bad shots. Um, don't get down on yourself. Don't get mad. But all that, what you should do, you know, you need to find it out yourself. How much does it really bring in the future if you're, if you're getting mad at yourself, if you don't believe in yourself anymore, just because of a bad hole. You know, I had that, I had that uh, chat with my, with my caddy, with Craig, uh, actually today. Uh, when he started caddying for me, he was a bit surprised that I didn't get too down on myself when I, when I made double bogey also. Um, and I said, yeah, of course you can get upset about it, but in the end of the day, I did my very, very best, you know, and I tried as hard as I can. And if double bogey in that case was the best, then it's okay. Of course, we make some silly mistakes, not only in golf, in life. We make some decisions. They are not good. But if you would have known before, you would have done a different, you would have chosen a different way. So it's okay. You know, it's, it's fine to hit bad golf shots. We don't go to the driving range to hit more perfect shots. We try to go to the driving range to hit the bad shots that they're still okay. So, and sometimes the okay shot is pretty bad, but that's how golf is, you know, it's, it's a game that you can't really control. And I think once you have that mindset that it's also okay that to, hit, to hit poor golf shots once in a while, that's fine. The only thing that you could, that you could get mad about is if you, if you make unnecessary mistakes. What I've done many times as an amateur, when, when you go up to, to the hole and say, I just finished the putt because only a foot away and then you miss that putt. That is just stupid. That is avoidable and that is no excuse. Um, but the rest, if you hit poor goal shots, I mean, move on to the next hole. No need to, to get mad at yourself too much. Thanks. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you much. Good luck with this weekend, Martin. Sorry, are you, are, are you a good golfer, William? Yeah, I'm okay. I play on the yes, Swedish team tour and yeah. Okay, we yeah. Play some competition. I will see you out here in a couple of years then. First tee, Wentworth, you and me. Final group, Sunday afternoon, my friend. Yeah, that sounds good. Good. I like the conference. Yes, I am a good golfer. So just a word <laughs> thank you, Thank you, William. Excellent. Uh, Angel, Angel Alvarez. Again, I might be totally Spanishifying that. He's not from Spain, but uh, Angel, um, your question. Hello, how are you? Hi, Andrew. Hi, Martin. Uh, yes, I'm from, from Spain. Hola. <laughs> from northern Spain in, in Burgos. Uh, my question was about Valderrama. Uh, why it's so special for you? But you have already answered that question in, in a previous question. So I'm going to change my mind. Uh, <laughs> I miss a lot of uh, six foot paths with my friends, a lot of them, more than I would like to. Uh, how could you keep your concentration? Uh, in, in Medina in 2012, when you made that path, uh, knowing what it was worth, uh, how could you keep your concentration and your nerves? How, how could you make that? Or just give us a clue how to, to try to do it. Thank you. Angel, I would, love to, I would love to answer that question. 
I really would. But it's something, it's one of those moments that, that, that they are so precious, it's very difficult to put into words. I was very lucky that over the last 15 years, my preparation of my mental work, of my putting, um, and all those things that they worked out in that moment. Um, I didn't really need to force myself or make myself aware of, Martin, you need to be focused now, come on, you need to concentrate. Don't think about this, don't think about that. It was a very clear thought, you know, for me, it's very strange to say, but it was pure enjoyment. It was pure joy to be in that position. Of course, you are excited. You're not nervous. There's a difference between nervous and excitement. So I was not nervous to, to miss the putt and I was just excited about the opportunity and the gift that I was given. So um, that attitude that I had when I made the first putt that helped me a lot in the second putt. Because even the first putt, I knew I just needed to make two putts to win the match. But somehow I wanted to make the first one because that was my attitude for the whole week. That is match play. You know, you always go, you always go, you're, you're very aggressive. And fortunately that mindset hasn't changed when I walked onto the 18th green. I still want to make the first putt even though two putts would have been enough, but my mindset was, was very clear and very straightforward how it was the last three days. And I think that concentration of always trying to make the next putt and not thinking that I could miss or I don't want a three putt, you know, there was never that knot in my head. And I think that was such an advantage, but I couldn't control it, it just happened. So, and that's why it's very difficult to explain. And maybe those moments when they happen in your career, those very, very iconic and special moments, man, maybe they're not meant to be explained, you know? Mm, yeah, excellent. I understand. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question Denada. as well, uh, Angel de Nada. Yeah. Um, right, moving on, actually, it follows on quite nicely from that uh, question. So Alex has uh, a question. Alex, I can see you there, and you are just about to unmute yourself. There you are. Right, go for it. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Martin. Uh, yeah, it's about Ryder Cup and majors. Um, looking back at your career and achievements up to this point, Martin, did you get more pleasure winning your first Ryder Cup or winning your first major? So just the audio wasn't great there, so just in case some of you didn't hear it, uh, did Martin get greater enjoyment from winning the Ryder Cup or from winning his first major? Well, winning the first Ryder Cup um, I was a bit overwhelmed. I didn't really know what, what to expect, but Montgomery, he had a great team, you know, playing in Wales. We, we were playing really, really well. Um, that was a great win for, for me, play my first Ryder Cup and win it uh, right away. At the same year, I won the first major, the PJ Championship. Again, you know, the main goal at the PJ Championship was to get enough points to make the Ryder Cup team into Wales. So then I found myself in a playoff and I thought, well, I mean, you're already here, so, and you have only one guy now to, to beat instead of 143 guys. So, and that was, that was quite nice that you could win that, uh, the PGA Championship, but the most joy was definitely the Ryder Cup. Um, Ryder Cup is, uh, well, if, if I answer the question today, um, maybe back then I didn't know what the Ryder Cup really means to me until I made that putt in 2012. You know, if you would have asked me maybe, a couple of weeks after the Ryder Cup, maybe it would have answered different, I don't know. But since Medina, my mindset about the Ryder Cup has changed a lot. Excellent. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah, yeah Cheers thank you very much indeed. So I've just realized everybody that I'm sitting under a spotlight and there's some sort of heavenly light shining down upon me here, uh, but yeah, also yeah, shining head, bald, on my yeah. head, exactly. It just uh, it almost makes it look worse. Right, anyway, good. So yeah, as we move on uh, self-consciously, uh, move on to John Brethrick. I'm glad we're moving on to John because John is bravely sitting outside and it looks like the sun is setting on him. And so John, the silhouette, is going to ask us this question. Hi there, Martin. Hi, John. Uh, yes, uh, a quick one. Where do you um, love going to play? Which cities and why? Um, where do I love to play? Love. Mm, I like to play um, in America because you always know what you're going to get. You always play golf courses there under great conditions. Um, I got a place a couple of years ago in Jupiter now. Um, I have an apartment there. Um, so I play a lot of golf around there. 
as I said, you know, you play great golf courses, almost golf courses that you can compare to what we play on tour. And therefore, the preparation for, for golf tournaments has been always great. Um, so that would be my, my place to go if I need to get ready for tournaments and where I, where I, have, where I have the most joy as well. Because you can take cards, you can listen to music, you can, you know, just have fun with your friends. It's a very relaxed atmosphere. Excellent. Good question. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, where are you, John? I'm curious. I'm just uh, sorry. I know this isn't a question John Bretherick session, but I'm going to move it out to that. Where are I'm, you? I'm, that you I'm just on the patio at uh, Fulford Golf Club. Fulford. I've just, yep. just played in a pro-am at uh, Yorkshire Pro-am today. Okay, here's a question from Martin. What is the German connection with Fulford Golf Club, famous German connection with Fulford Golf Club in Yorkshire? Is that a question for me that I should know? No, you shouldn't really know. But it's, No, uh, you should. You should. Okay. Really? It's about yeah. Bernard Langer out there. Oh, wow. come on. Now we're we going into golf history. It's a, it's a famous shot of him. Look him up. Look up the photo of Bernard Langer in Fulford, and he's just basically hitting a shot from up a tree. He found his ball up a tree ah, in okay. the well, tournament he used to play there. Oh, yeah, okay. was it the Benson yeah. Hedges that used to play up there? Anyway, and old Bernard climbed up a tree and hit a shot. So thorough and meticulous was he in his See, Very his athletic shot. man. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, we're digressing slightly. We're, going, we're coming towards the end here. We've got three more questions to go. George Anthony, where's George with his with the next question? Hello, hello. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, Martin. Um, Hi, you were an up and coming star um, a couple of years ago. Are there any players on the tour now that um, uh, you're excited about, and you can kind of see yourself in, in them? Yeah, I think uh, Rasmus Hoygaard, you know, he has been playing really, really well um, the last, I would say, 12 months. He had, he had an early win in his career. Um, the way he carries himself um, is very authentic, very calm. He knows, it, or at least the way it seems, you know, he knows what, what he's doing. He has good people around him and a good fundamentals, you know, to to, to build up on, you know, his, his basics in the golf swing, short game seems really, really solid. So I would, if I would put money on somebody for the next few years to win some big events, that would be my guy. That was, that was part of the question, actually. <laughs> the betting. Okay, so you can go and bet now. We, we do 50-50. <laughs> yeah, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed, George. Can you see there? Bernard Langer, up a tree. Oh, yeah, okay. Shot. So, oh, wow, yeah. Let's see, bringing that a bit of archive golf. So, Fulford, Bernard Langer. Anyway, um, good again. I'm going slightly off topic. Right, Stuart Robertson, a couple of questions to go. Stuart, what's your question? Hi, Martin. Um, you, my question was you've kind of answered it because my question was if you only could play one more round, where would you play? Um, but so, on that basis, um, what is your favourite tournament win over which course? Well, one of my favorite wins that I had in my career was in St. Andrews, you know, when I played the Alfred Dunhill, especially that week I played with one of my best friends. Um, fortunately enough, um, I could, Johan Rupert always allowed me to bring one of my friends or family to play with. So um, uh, to win in the home of golf, um, one of the biggest European tour events that we have, that was, that was a really, really nice feeling, especially that year. It was 2010. I had great success, and to to top it off with uh, with that trophy, that was that was huge. Franci, you have the last question. Francisco Benza, who um, again, I'm, I'm probably entirely mispronouncing that, but Franci, you have the last question, I think. That was actually quite well pronounced. Um, great to speak to fellow German golfer, and good luck this weekend, Martin. Thank you. So I have the advice question to ask you, but that's already been asked, so I've slightly changed it. Okay. Um, considering that golf is a very high pressure sport and can at times be very frustrating, as we all know. And then also there's the constant traveling and other aspects of playing professional golf that can be incredibly stressful. How do you look after your mental health and well-being? For me, a game changer was food. Um, I was not eating very well, um, I would say 10, 12 years ago. Um, I mean, okay, that's a bit of an insight, but... Uh, it's very embarrassing, but I still share it with you. Um, back in the day, my brother and me, when we played some amateur tournaments, sometimes we went to McDonald's the evening before and had the burger before the round the next day. 
That's disgusting. So how can you expect to play? I, I see you, Andrew. Well, um, so, no, I'm uh, sorry. I just uh, you you got a McDonald's the night before to get the food that you can have it the next morning because there was no breakfast that early. So we need to eat something. I know it's disgusting. Worked out well in the end. Anyways, moving on to now. Um, I think the mental health is, of course, it's important, but you need a balance. If you focus only on the golf and only on your success, and if golf is the reason for happiness or sadness, then you need to change. Because the golf, or in general, the job can't be the reason for your mental state. And fortunately, I found that balance in my life, that um, I care a lot about the sport, um, because it's not only my job, you know, that's my lifestyle. You know, that is, I give my passion and my love, my emotions to the sport. And I dedicate a lot to it. And that's why I also deserve to get away from the sport when I need to. Um, and I think that was very important for me to understand over the last 10 years that it's okay to have a break for a few days. It's okay to go on vacation for a week. Because when I started out, uh, out on tour, I never went on vacation. I never really treated myself to anything because I was always working and thinking I need to be better, I need to be better. But for your mental health, it's very important to find that balance. That's a great question to uh, finish with. Thank you for that, Francie, and thank you, Martin. Um, well, what an insight on so many topics from all of you. Uh, great questions, and I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this session. Uh, Martin, many, many, uh, well, I was going to say, you know, just have a great week. I, I'd I, love I'm to see go you. to McDonald's and get a happy meal. Well, exactly. I'm going tomorrow. off now and going to stick something in the fridge. I have a lovely breakfast tomorrow. Um, yeah, exactly. Anyway, listen, thank you very much indeed. Have a great week. It's always a, Thanks, I guys. know it's different down there at Wentworth this week. Everywhere is different to the moment, but I hope it goes well for you and for the rest of the season. Thank you to all of you for joining as well. Uh, we shall see you somewhere out in cyberspace, perhaps. But many thanks again to Martin Keimer, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for hosting, Andrew. Good luck. Martin, thank you. You've been watching uh, Hilton's uh, An Audience with Martin Keimer. Thanks for watching. All the best. Bye-bye. To watch another European Tour video, click here. And to subscribe, click here.